Regardless of the axis it's on, I, and you have a perpendicular measurement, we'll call this rho, and we'll talk about this being a rho, it would be a direction away from the actual contact point. Well, we want to know the H field here. This H field is given as I over 2 pi rho. And, and then it's in a direction, and you can do it this way. It can be, instead of putting a phi down here, because that can be a little uh, confusing, you could put down a i crossed into a rho. Now, it will be a phi, if this is the z, if this were in cylindrical coordinates and this is on the z axis, then a i crossed a rho will be a phi, but the thing I'm going to tell you about is a phi there indicates only that it's in the phi direction with respect to this current. This does not have to be on the z-axis. This will always work, where ai is a unit vector in the direction of the current. So here, ai would be in the direction of the current. A rho is, in a, is a vector direction away from the actual contact point of the 90 degree angle. I hope this helps you, because this is a very good question. So when we look at this setup, we have two currents. I'm going to get the H field from the first infinite current right here. And this would be 90 degrees. Do you see it? All right, we'll call this rho 1. Now, what is rho 1? Well, it's a vector, and it's from the contact point here to the origin, right? You'll notice this passes through zero, this one. It's infinitely long. It's in the x direction. So if you look at the perpendicular, and I'll try to do this carefully, if this is y and this is z, this point is a current, and it's, at, it's down 3, and it's up 4, Right? This is your current coming out of the board, correct class? This would be I1. 
So when we look at this, our vector rho here would be point, what, the way you get this is you take the coordinates of the point of observation, which are zero, minus the coordinates where the center is of that wire. So here, in the row direction, it's zero minus, and then for, we'll do y first, zero minus a minus three, right? So it's zero minus quantity minus three, a y, right? And then for uh, the z direction, it's gonna be zero minus, and then this is gonna be four, a z, where we can see that the radius vector rho is really equal to three a y minus four a z. Do you see that? Right. Now I'm just getting the vector length between these two. Take the point of observation minus the source of the h rho. Right. Are you with me on this one? All right. Now once I have that, I know for this current right here. AI, this would be the first current, it's in the x direction, you told me that, right? right so now, I'm just gonna get to the H field from the first one. Therefore, the H field from the first current would be equal to I, and that was two amps, right? I'll put it down first. Yes. I one over two pi rho one, and then it's going to be AI crossed into a row. So H1 would then be I1 is 2 over 2 pi. Row 1 down there, you can put a magnitude. Well, row 1 here would be the magnitude of this. You all see how the magnitude of row here would be square root of three squared plus four squared, or it would be just five. With me? That's nine, right? And 16 is 25 squared, 25 is five. So I can put down five, right? And then I need this AI crossed into A row. Well, AI is the unit vector in the direction of the current, which is what class? The first one. AX. AX, right. AX crossed, and what is A rho? How do I get A rho from that vector rho? Remember? So there's a vector, right? Isn't A rho? The vector over the magnitude. Right, vector over magnitude rho, correct? All right, so it's going to be crossed into. Here it's. 3 AY. 3 AY minus 4 A. Z, right? Minus 4AZ. And so for the magnitude of that, right? The magnitude of that would just be 5, wouldn't it? Yes. So I can make that 5 squared there. Do you agree? All right. Now, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go down a step. You all follow me on what I'm doing, right? So now for H1, this is the field just from the first current. The twos cancel, and I have 1 over 25 pi, right? And then when I do the cross product, what do I get? AX crossed AY is? Two. X, AX crossed AY is AZ, isn't it? Remember, X, Y, Z, and then Usually I go this way, it's plus, right? So AX crossed AY is AZ. Y'all with me on this? So it's AZ. We don't have a three AZ, right? And then what? AX crossed AZ is? Minus AY, is it? Because I'm going this way. AX crossed AZ is minus AY, isn't it? Right? So it's minus, a minus is plus. So that means that's my final field value, H1, right? Does this answer your question for that part? Now, we're not done yet because we have to get the H field for the second one, right? So what is the H field from the second one? Well, H from the second one would be I2, right? 
over 2 pi rho 2. And then it's going to be a i 2 crossed into a rho 2, right? So first, let's get rho 2. What is the vector rho 2 going to be? This is the point of observation at the origin, right? This is going to be what, three. This is three. three. Negative three. Uh, so it's going to be what? Three minus three y. Minus three y. Say y. Um, minus three a y. Anything else? No. no. Right. There's no vertical displacement, and you ignore the infinite coordinate, obviously, because you're looking at the perpendicular distance. Y'all with me? So now when we take a look at this, we've got that, uh, what is AI to? Well, what direction is the track? AZ. AZ, right? So it's AZ. Now we do it. We put H2, the second, H, the H field from the second current would be I2, and I2 is three, right? Three over 2 pi, and the magnitude of rho is, class? Uh, 3. Just 3. Yeah. Over 3, kind of convenient. And then we have AI2. And what is AI2? AZ. AZ. Crossed into A rho 2. What is A rho 2? It's a unit vector in the direction of rho 2. What, what is it? Just take vector over magnitude. What do you get? Minus 3ay divided by 3, right, is minus ay. Isn't it, it class? You all follow me on this? Yes. Right, so that's just minus ay. Right? So when you look at this, you see how the 3s cancel. Right? And so I have 1 over 2 pi. And then what do I get? Well, what is AZ crossed AY? Just look up there. AZ crossed AY right is minus AX. Minus AX. With a minus AX. sign is plus AX, right? Because there's a minus sign here, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's just AX. So that would be the H field from the second one. So when we want the H field total, It's H1 plus H2. It's going to be just 1 over 2 pi AX. And then it's plus 4 over 25 pi. plus 3 over 25 pi AZ, right? And you can do the math on this one and get singular values. In the answers for this one, um, do they have, uh, do they have like 1 over 2 pi in the answer form or do they have a number? I think they have a number. Yeah, they got 160AX plus 51AY plus 38AZ. What, what are the units? Milliamperes per meter. All right, so for this first one, 1 over 2 pi is 0.16, is that right? Can you, I mean, if you've got a calculator, just do it. That way we'll prove that this is in fact right. If you can just take 1 over 2 pi, tell me what it is for the coefficient. I think it is 0.16. Yes, 0.16. AX, and what about uh, 4 over 25 pi? Uh, 0 0.051. AY, and for 3 over 25 pi? 0 0.038. And can you confirm that the units of this would be amps per 
meters. Is that right? Yes, that's right, that's correct. All right, you follow me the way I did this? No. Yes. Now this kind of a problem, it gets, here's the confusing part. In Dr. Wentworth's book, he has a feed, and people don't know how to get a feed. He does explain it within the discussions in the chapter, but it's always going to be AI, the direction of the current, crossed into the direction of the unit vector from the center of that infinite current to the point of observation. Okay, good question. What else? That's a good problem. Because it's not, it doesn't fit uh, the standard way of putting a current on the axis. Here we have off axis. That's a good problem. What else you got? <laughs> Questions about homework? I don't know how many problems I gave you. I didn't give you a whole lot, but I gave you several. Like, didn't I give you a loop problem? You have any more for me or not? No? So the next thing we're going to do is going to be the atrial. We did an interline, right? So now we're going to do a loop. We also did a finite line in a sense. We set up the integration for a finite line. So now we're going to do a loop of current. Now this pair, you know how these parallel with what we did in electrostatics? Electrostatics, you have an infinite line of charge, we got the E field. Here we had an infinite line of current, and we got the H field. By the way, that H field from there is something that you can approximate a power line H field near the actual core of the power line, very close to that. Right. So, next, we look at a loop of current. In Dr. Wentworth's book, and he's smart doing this, he always makes sure that he tries to use the, the uh, properties of symmetry. So, here's what he does he puts a loop of a radius. A, or you can use rho, but he uses A here, and he's got a current going counterclockwise looking down the z-axis. This is the current I, and it's flowing all the way around here. It's a DC current. And what he wants is the H field on the z-axis. Do you all follow me on this? Uh, this is the example in the book. If you have your books, you can open it up. It's right after the infinite line of current. And you can get a page number. So what I'm going to do is say that the way we always do this is we start with the bias of arc law. Because this is the classic approach. And we say that if we have a current here, and this is going to be I DL. Now, you can't watch this. Remember, DL is a vector. It has to do with the differential length and the direction the current element is. So this is going to be I. And what's the differential length here? Well, the differential length is the wiper arm hip movement. And that would be equal to the radius A, it would be in the D feet, or A, D feet, and it would be A feet. You with me on this class? That would be the differential length. That's this length right here. If you think about it, that length has to be the differential here, which is D feet, times the radius vector, correct? So that's the differential length, therefore IDL is really I times A D phi A phi. 
Now, the next thing we need is this radius vector. And this radius vector is rho here. And you'll notice it goes from the point of observation, I mean from the source point to the point of observation to give us that. So what would rho be? This would be rho right here. Well, start with the rho coordinate. What is the rho coordinate here on the z-axis? This, this point is going to be h at point 0, 0, z. So it's just right on the z-axis. And so what, what is the rho coordinate of the z-axis? Is it zero? Zero. Yeah. Uh, it's zero minus what's the rho coordinate here? Uh, a, isn't it? The radius, right? So here, when I get rho, it would be zero minus a, because it's always point of observations coordinates minus source points coordinates. It's going to be that a rho. What about for z? What's the point of observation of this? Z. Z. Right? What's z here? Zero. Zero. So it's just plus z. A z. Therefore, rho vector is equal to minus a a rho plus z a z. That's it. Now, here we get dh. Let me make a comment. When we get dh here, it's going to be i, right, dl crossed into a rho over, this is the bios of art law, over, now, and then this is going to be, for bios of art, this becomes 4 pi rho magnitude squared, right? Y'all drink that? Remember the bios of art law? It's very, it parallels Coulomb's law. But instead of charge, we have current, right? It's divided by 4 pi rho squared, which is the surface area of a sphere, if you're thinking about that. And it's, but now we got that crazy cross product, DL crossed A rho. So let's go ahead and do this. So therefore, the differential H field from that differential current element there would be IDL, or it's this. It's equal to I times A D phi, A phi. Then it's over 4 pi. And what is rho magnitude? That's just equal to the square root of a squared plus c squared, right? And if I wanted unit vector a rho, that's rho vector over magnitude of rho, and that would just be minus a a rho plus z a z over square root of a squared plus z squared, right? You drink it? So when I go ahead and do this, I'm going to show you something. I know I'm going to have a squared plus z squared down here for rho squared. And then I've got to take this and cross it into a rho. So a rho is right here. So that's crossing into minus a a rho plus z a z, right? But it's divided by the square root of that, so I just make this 3 halves power right there. Take a look at this. Make sure you agree with me. Well, because 1 over the square root of a squared plus z squared, that's really 1 over a squared plus z squared to the 1 half. I, I take that and I multiply it by a squared plus z squared to the 2 halves, or 1, and I get 3 halves. Do you agree with this, everyone? So we come down to that, and now we have to do the cross products. And I'll take out the constants. So I have A, I mean, I have I, A over here. I have D, phi there. I have 4 pi. I have A squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves power. And 
now I'm going to do this cross product. So, and some of you might not remember this, so if I'm in cylindrical coordinates, I have rho cross phi cross z all back to rho positive. Do you all remember that? Now, some of you, uh, if you don't work with this stuff, I mean, really immerse yourself, you can forget stuff like this and then really, you know, mess up a problem. So you gotta make sure you're on top of this. So when I have this, look at the first cross. I have a phi cross a rho. What is that going to be? Negative a z. Minus a z. Very good. So this is going to be minus a z with the minus a is a a z. Do you all agree with that? Right? Yes. Keep going on. Then I have a phi cross a z, which is negative rho. Rho. A phi yeah. cross A Z is a positive, isn't it? A phi, yes. Yeah, positive A phi. Right? Going this way, all positive. If we go this way, it's negative. All right, so we're going positive. So it's plus A phi. Or plus A rho, pardon me. A rho. My bad. A rho. Okay, now I'm going to break this out, and actually, no, I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to make some comments. Now, when you take a look at the AZ coordinate, that's vertically upward, right? I want you to just follow me on this. It's important. No matter where I am on this circle, if I'm here, if I'm here, if I'm here, or I'm here, Z is always straight up. Y'all follow me on that? But when I take a look at a row, if I'm here, a row would be pointing in the opposite direction, right? As that. If I'm here, a row would be pointing in that direction. It's pointing away from the current element. You with me? Yes. Now that direction obviously changes. And, and it, this doesn't capture the change. The a row coordinate there doesn't have the information about the actual angular portion of that. Follow me? It's not like one at an angle of 30 degrees feet. Follow me? So what we can do with a row, and I'm just gonna say this, he doesn't do it in the book. He just argues that the integration around the loop will cancel that. What I can actually do with that is a row is actually equal to cosine of phi a x plus sine of phi a y. And I'll just do this here for you one time. If I call this x and this y, z would be coming out of the board, and I have a row, right? A row here has some angle phi. We don't have phi implicit here. It's not something when I have the a row here, it doesn't say what phi direction is. That's the problem. It's ambiguous. But if you look at this, if this is a row, well, the projection on the a -ax, x axis right there would be cosine of phi a x, right? Yeah. And then the projection on the vertical axis would be sine of phi a y, correct? Now, I'm going to go ahead and just put that in here, and I'm going to explain why I'm doing it in a second. So I have cosine of phi a x plus sine of phi a y instead of my a row. Even though Whitworth doesn't do this, I want you to see it. Y'all with me? Okay. Now I want to get the total age field, right? So to get the total age field, age total on the z-axis, this is on the z-axis at coordinate 0 comma 0 z, now, I can take all the constants out in front. So I have A, I mean, I have I. Should have I. And, and you'll notice one thing. I'm going to leave the A out here. I have 4 pi. Then I have A squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves power. The reason I left that out here is you'll notice that A and Z don't change when I do a DP integration. They're constants. And then, I go ahead and I do the integrations. 
I have a d phi integrated from 0 to 2 pi d, uh, a z plus, and then I have the integration of z, I can take that out front, integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine of phi d phi a x plus z times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of phi d phi a y. Y'all follow me what I'm doing here? We've got to integrate d phi. Right, there's the d phi right there. Got to go all the way around. Y'all with me? Now, I got a question for you. Anybody? What is the integral of a cosine from 0 to 2 pi? Cosine of phi from 0 to 2 pi. Zero. It will be 0, exactly. The area above is the same as the area below. We could prove that by saying the integral of a cosine would be what? Sine of phi. And evaluate sine at 2 pi is 0, minus sine is 0, 0, 0 minus 0 is 0, right? We can prove that. Yeah. What about the integral of sine phi d phi from 0 to 2 pi? Uh, 0 as well. Both of these will be 0. That means this is the only component that actually survives the integration. And when all is said and done, this is just going to be 2 pi a. Do you all see that? Now, if you look carefully, there's going to be a 2 pi and 4 pi. So that means the total h field on the z-axis from a loop, a single loop, h on the z-axis from that ring, if you take a look at this, the 2 pi will come out of there. We'll divide the 4 pi as a half. So now I have i a squared, there's an a there, and there's an a there, it's a squared, right? over 2, a squared plus c squared to the 3 halves power, and it will be in the a z direction, right? And that is the h field, anywhere on the z axis for a loop centered at the origin. I want you to take note of one thing that's real important. The key thing in calculating the H field on an axis that runs right through the center of the loop is this distance here. Now, if that loop was five meters high and I wanted the H field on the Z axis in six meters, the apparent Z would be one. Do you all follow me? It's always the distance between the center of the loop and the point of observation on an axis, axis that penetrates the center of the loop. Furthermore, AZ here could be replaced with a unit vector that's in the direction of a perpendicular going through the center of the axis. Do you all follow me? Now I can put that in. I'll leave this here. I mean, I can put it in. What you can do is just do this, put a little perpendicular here. So you know that's the perpendicular vector to the actual area of the loop, I mean to the plane of the loop. And then here, instead of z, you could actually put the distance difference between the point of observation and the center of the loop. But I'm going to leave it like that. Y'all with me on this? So that's really how you get the h field from a loop. Now, obviously I've got to say a few things about this. Most of the time, or I'm going to say just a couple things just with a single loop. Now, where would the H field be a maximum just by looking at that on the z-axis? And what happens as z goes to infinity for the H field? It tapers off. Huh? It tapers off. Goes to zero, doesn't it? Matter of fact, any kind of a finite current, just like before when you had a finite charge, finite amount of charge or finite amount of current, causes an E or H field to go to zero at infinity. It has to. If it didn't, then we have an infinite energy. And the only thing that has an infinite energy is an infinite current or an infinite charge. Y'all follow me on that? Mm -hmm. So, 
that H field will go to zero. Where is the H field the maximum on the z-axis? Now, you can do this with a derivative, right? Take a derivative of that, set it equal to zero, see where it's zero, and then solve for the value if you want the value. But where, intuitively, look at that. Where do you think it's a maximum? H field. It would be what? Right here, right the origin. Right, if you plotted that, when z goes to zero, look what you have. You got a squared upstairs, then you would have a cubed downstairs. It'd be one over a. Y'all with me? Another thing uh, I'm going to point out is that the h field never changes directions. Remember, if we had a loop of charge and you were below it, the e field's pointing away. Right? Remember that? Here, it's always in the same direction. One other thing I'm going to tell you, if you had a loop of charge and you want to know what the E field was on the Z axis, it would be zero at the origin. Do you all see that? Because all the charge, the differential charges would all be pointing Point at each other in terms cancel of the each other differential out. E field. They'll cancel. It's zero. And it's also zero at infinity. So somewhere between zero and infinity, it's relative maximum. How would you calculate that? In general, the E field from a line charge, if you had rho L as the, the charge density there, the E field from that on the z-axis, this is going to be the charge now. No, I'm trying to draw the parallels there. Well, it would be proportional to rho L. It would be divided by 2. It would be proportional to A squared plus E squared to the 3 halves power. Upstairs, it would be proportional to a squared, or I'm sorry, to a times z. Now, if you look in your book, I, I'm sorry, I don't have my, can I look in yours for one second? If you go back to the chapter, uh, you can put your phone there. And I'll just flip back. If you go back to the chapter here, so they have a loop. I'm going to ask you to watch it there. When I teach, I like to draw. Here's the loop, right? 42 and 43. It's on 142 on the top. Well, wait a second. Does he actually do it? No. Actually, that's for a disc that he's doing. I'm sorry. It's uh, 138. It's 138, uh, that equation is a number. But you see how it's a times h, h is z, a is the radius, over two, and I forgot the epsilon. This would be the d field. But you see, on this one, there's a z. It's not just z squared, or uh, yeah, z squared, right? So it's a times z, do y'all see that? Now, the other one's a squared, isn't it? Take a look at this. Y'all see how that's zero at z equals zero, right? How would you find out where it's a maximum? This is a very good question. Sometimes I'm inclined to ask where it's a maximum on a test. Write it down. I just said I will ask this on a test. I hope somebody is listening out there. Gotta know this. So where how do you get the maximum? Let me make sure everybody sees this. If we were to plot just the magnitude of this E field right here versus Z, we know it's zero at the origin, right? Somewhere out there, it's going to hit a maximum and it's going to go down, right? How do we find the maximum? Take a derivative of this and set it equal to zero. Do y'all remember this class? Remember? If you want the maximum of a function, you take the derivative, because right here, the derivative of this function with respect to z is zero, isn't it? So you find out that value of z by taking the derivative. Now, you'll notice when you take the derivative of this, you've got z upstairs, and you've got a squared over z squared to the 3 halves downstairs. So when you take the derivative, take the derivative of the first, which would be derivative of z would be 1, divided by a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves, 
plus z first times the derivative of the second, which would be minus 3 halves over a squared plus e squared to the 5 halves, right? And then you would have 2z come out in front. I'm just doing the derivative in my mind. And you would have to set that equal to 0. You all follow me? I'm going to ask you to do that for homework. Find out where that's the maximum in terms of a and find on, on the z-axis. Just go ahead and write that down for a homework problem. Because you're going to get this. Uh, but that's how you do that. And remember, there it's quite different in terms of the maximum value. For, for the h field uh, from a loop, it's at, at, at z equals 0. For the e field, or from an uh, infinite loop of charge, it's somewhere between 0 and infinity. And the way you get it is taking a derivative of that function. Y'all with me? It's not hard. Let's set it equal to zero. All right. Next. Now I talk about, well, that's the H field from a single loop. What happens if we had two turns that were very thin wire on top of each other? What do you think happens to the H field from two turns? Doubles. Just doubles, exactly. If we're talking about thin wire turns. As a matter of fact, for any small stack of wires here, the H field at any point will just be the H field of 1 times N. All right. And you all know what I'm talking about. Like, think of an inductor where it has turns of wire rolled over it, right? Solenoid. Hmm? Yes, yeah, solenoid. Now, so I'm just I'm mentioning that. Now, after that, in Wentworth's book, I'm going to leave this, not that, I'm going to leave, I don't know, I'm choose a new one. Let's do the solenoid. I want to show you what they do. On page 221, it's a solenoid. I want to tell you one other thing about this. The, these problems are very real kind of problems that you run into and you should know how to know. So when we have a solenoid, I exist on each turn, and I think you follow me, and I think in his book, does he have a symmetric clothing origin? The, yeah, he does. See how he has the same? And what we want to do is find the H field at any point Z. So here we want the H field on the Z axis from this current. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of turns. So what I'm going to do, because you can't see it if I try to give you a three-dimensional perspective. What you're going to see is this. If we cut this thing right down, like where the board is, what we do is see where the turns open, and we have this. We have this axis, which will be Z, and we have the Y axis here. And what you would see is this. And here you would have, in his book it shows you this, you're going to have a whole bunch of 
cut wires shown. You're with me? Here the radius is going to be A. And here's how we do this. And I, I, I call this the building block approach. It's a term I use. I don't know if other people use it. So here's what we do. We know we have I, we're going to have current swirling this way. So the current would be going in there, coming out there. And I don't need to put this down everywhere. You got this. We got current I. And we have, uh, this is going to be at minus H over 2, and this is going to be at H over 2. And it's centered at the origin. Y'all follow me? Okay. The radius is A. And what they want to do is this. It's what we want to do. Now listen up, because this is good. We're going to say we're at a point Z. And we need, maybe we need a new mark. At least one of it works. So, what we're going to do is, we're at a point Z, but we're at a height right here, Z prime. And we're going to say we're going to take a thin sliver right there, a ring. This would be like one single ring that's got this width to it. So think about just a ring like this. I'm sure you can. Of height DZ with a current I. I mean, really, it's going to be a current flowing line. And the current here, I, would actually be equal, or di right there would be equal to n divided by h times i. And let me explain how I'm getting this. This would be the differential current there. If you think about this, I've got n turns, and each one of those turns is, turns has i current. Now just think about this: the total amount of current swirling around would be n times i, right? So if you think about it, n times i would be the total amount of current swirling around. And if I divide that by h, now I get the current density, right? And that would be a current, and the actual units of this would be amps per meter. And that would be my differential current, or it's actually the current, differential current density. So if I take this right here, and we'll just call this, I don't know, I'll just leave it like this. If I take this and multiply it by dz, right, then I get di. Then this and this, the units of meters cancel, I get amps. Do you all see that class? So I have ni over h. And here's what I do. I say this is a z prime. And I want to know dh right here from that. I'm going to put it over here. And I bet you can, some of you can see this. I know you can. I wish we had, we're missing Willie. I think he's still sick probably. We're missing that guy. The one fella that came is, hasn't showed up for weeks on end. I don't think he's coming. He, he said he had a job. He's also doing a co-op job. So I think he might be visiting his house. We probably dropped him because he's missed quizzes and everything. And then, who else we got? Him and him and really? That's it, right? So we're missing three of the actives. Well, sorry. One, two of the actives, right? Still a lot. That's 40% of the class, if you think about it. Willie emailed me, and I think he might still be sick. He just felt sick, so there's the African American. So, what we do is this. We're going to get the differential field from this di. And we're going to do it. I'm going to first put down. I know that the actual h field from a loop centered at the origin, we found this, was i a squared over 2 a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves, right? And then this was in the az direction. Y'all remember that? 
we just did this. Here's how this translates. Instead of I, we're going to have DI. All right? So I'm going to put this down. We're going to have, and this will become DH will be equal to DI. And I'll replace that in a second times A squared over 2 A squared plus C squared to the 3 halves power. But here's what I have to do. Instead of Z squared there, remember what I told you. That what we care about is the distance between the source, right, and the point of observation. This delta is for this whatever you want to call it, this distance, which is going to be z, right, minus z prime is what we actually want there for z. Don't class, we want the distance between this, the loop that's causing the current and the point of observation on the z-axis. Y'all follow me on this? Are you with me? Right? Yes. All right, so I've got to put that in here. What is that distance? It's just going to be what? Z minus Z prime squared, and this whole thing's going to be to the 3 halves power, right? Now, it's in the AZ direction. Now, here. You see how this is DI? Right here? Right? It's N times I over H. That's the density times dz would be the amount, di. So I'm going to replace this with that. I'll rewrite one more time. So now I have 2 a squared plus z minus z prime squared to the 3 halves power. Then it's times a squared. Then I have n i over h, but instead of dz, I'm going to put dz prime, and here's why. Because this, this coordinate is z prime, so the differential is dz prime. It's going to integrate out in a second anyway. And it would be in the az direction. And that is the differential h field from that differential current slice, right? that little singular loop there, right? And how do we always get the total H field now when we have the differential? Talk about the number of turns. We integrate it, don't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, we integrate it. So to get the total H field, we're gonna take the integral of that. Now I'm gonna take out the constant. So the A squared and I over H comes out from Then I divide by 2. I can take the AZ out in front too. And then I have an integral of DZ prime over A squared plus Z prime minus Z squared to the 3 halves power. And that goes from minus h over 2 to h over 2. Now, if you look at this right here, I'm going to make a suggestion. Do you agree with me? What don't you see? All right. Uh, you see how you've got, instead of having just a single variable, you've got two right here, right? So what we can do is just say, let u be equal to z prime minus z, and therefore du can be equal to dz prime. Y'all follow me on this? It's a simple change of variable. So I'm going to stick with this one. So now I make this the u, right? And then du is d, I mean, this becomes du. But here, uh, this is z goes from uh, minus h over 2 to h over 2, which means u goes from z prop. Uh, yeah. h minus 2 minus z prime. 
and negative h minus two minus q prime. So that goes minus from um, uh, z prime minus h over two, right? To z prime plus h over two. And then I can put back in, it should integrate out though. Oh, I know what it is. I need uh, z, z prime actually goes from there to there. So this goes from uh, z, or u goes from Let me explain this. I'm integrating z prime. So z prime goes from h over 2, minus h over 2, to plus h over 2. So if that's the case, then I subtract, I subtract z from this. Okay. So this is going to be h over 2, minus h over 2, minus z. You all follow me on that? Right. All right, so now we do that integration. Now, for this integration, this is a, uh, this boils down to tan, a, a tan secant integration type thing, but if you look in your book, when all is said and done, you're going to have a 1 over a squared plus u squared to the 1 half power, if, well, we can do this if you want, but. And does he actually show you? No, oh, he shows you appendix in appendix D, but this is this boils down to a tan secant integration. The integral is found and he has it right there, right? So then he has ni over 2h. So this whole thing, I'm gonna put it here. And this is gonna be ni over 2h, right? And then it's going to be the quantity z plus, I believe it's h over 2, over the square root of a squared plus z plus h over 2 squared minus, and then it's going to be z minus h over 2. You can take a look at this and tell me if I'm wrong. Over square root of a squared plus z minus h over 2 squared. I think that's what he has. i got to be careful. Yeah, uh, in the az direction, like that. The az, right? Now, in the limit, and this is important, in the limit as the length of this thing goes to infinity, I just want you to hear me on this one, and you go to infinity, then you've got h over 2 here, uh, as h goes to infinity, all right, plus h goes to infinity, then you're going to have this h and that h cancel, the z upstairs becomes inconsequential. And when all is said and done, I'm just going to put it down here, and he has it. So if this was infinitely long or very narrow, and let me try to do it this way, because he shows you this. So if we assume a quote, quote, long solid one, very long, and we're near the center. So I'm just going to put near the center, and then comma, and on the z-axis. On z-axis. Then this h field, we don't have this down here, this h field, right at the center, is about equal to ni over h. And it will be a z. It'll be in the direction of the actual solenoid surface area you cut it. So that's about what it is, and make sure you put down at center. 
Y'all see, you see that in this book? He'll have this. Let me show you what it is. Very similar to someone right here. Because that's useful right there. Ni over H. Do you see that? That's equation 4.12. I got something else to tell you about this, though. So that's approximately what the, I mean, that's the H field. And it's very close to this, the long cylinder. If you have something over the length of the cylinder H, then this is diameter A. If you have H right, over A, it is much, much greater than one, very long. And you're at the center, that's it. Now, at the ends, it would be less. Uh, it'll be less. And the way you would get it at the ends is you would make Z H over two. Do you see that? Because at the center, Z is zero. And if Z is zero, then you have this, right? You have H over two on top, and then you have minus, since z is zero, a minus h over two, or plus h over two, or you really have h on top, right, and thinking about it. Down here, if z is zero, you have a squared plus h over two squared, a squared plus h over two squared two, with z is zero, h over two. and this, just take the value of one and double it, right, and you'll, in fact, get that, you get ni over um, h at the center. Now, at, when you're at h over 2, one of the ends, that's the ends, right? It's either plus or minus h over 2. Then you have h over 2 plus h over 2, h here, right? Here you have h over 2 minus h over 2, it's 0, so this goes away. you see that? Right? If you're at the top, it's h over 2, right? Right? Can you say that again? Sure. Here, the length of this thing is h, right? Yes. This top is h over 2. Okay. All right. When z, that's z. So when z is h over 2, I have h over 2, h over 2, I have h, don't I? Over here, I have h over 2 minus h over 2 is 0. Right? So this one goes away. Okay. Now I have h over square root of a squared plus h over 2 plus h over 2 is h. So I have h over the square root of a squared plus h squared. Okay. Y'all follow me? Yes. a squared plus h squared times ni over h. And here you get into the thing. I'll just show you this. So I'll at the ends, and I'll let me just. But negative h two doesn't contribute much at the very at the extreme end. It's kind of like conservation. Yeah. What, uh, what I'm going to do is put it down here at ends at ends, or at z equals h over 2, we just put end of solenoid. The h field itself, now you can see there's ni over 2h right here out the front, right? And then we get rid of that second one, and it's times h over the quantity square root of a squared plus a squared, isn't it? Now take a look at that value. You see how the h's go away? So I have the h field equal to ni over 2, 1 over the square root of a squared plus a squared. And here's the deal. If h, listen to me now, if h is much greater than a, so if h is much greater than a, then h field at the ends will be approximately just ni over 2 h, because a you can assume the square root of h squared is h. All right, now look at this value compared to the center. At the center, it was ni over h there, it's ni over 2h, it's half. So if you got a long solenoid with a whole lot of terms, the h will be in this half. Why am I talking about this? Because we didn't get into magnetic forces yet. But if you got a whole lot of turns around here, something like that, and the h field is down the axis, you have yourself the makings of a coil gun. Do you know what a coil gun is? You ever hear that term? Coil gun, look it up on YouTube. 
There's railgun and coil gun. I've made both. I've had students work with, basically assist students, students in making, made a couple of rail guns and helped one master's project make a coil gun. Now here's the deal. If you put something that's got a magnetic tendency, like a ferrite, like a nail, or you put a real magnet here at the core and you've got to constrain this thing to only move up and down too. I throw a switch and I generate a huge magnetic, or a huge current causing a magnetic field. Now this thing's pulled towards the center. But as it gets near the center, I extinguish the field. Otherwise the thing would just bounce back and forth. And that thing go zooming out. And you know, we built the coil gun. I'm just gonna tell you this. I'll, I'll try to explain this in a little more detail when we get through magnetic forces. So as a master student, he was from textile engineering, actually industrial engineering, I think now. And what they wanted to do was take if you know anything about the way textiles are made, you have something called a, sh it's basically- Shuttlecock. It is a shuttlecock. Uh, and, and what they do is they have strings this way, and what they do is separate them, and they throw string this way with the, it comes out of what's called a shuttlecock. Then the strings weave back, trap that length, and then they throw the shuttlecock through it this way. They go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's weaving the old fashioned way. Well, I thought, why not just use a coil gun, fire a projectile with some way of attaching thread to it, pull it through, and then have the thing basically go around and get reloaded in a coil gun, you know, and fire it through again. That's the idea. A lot more to this. So, he thought, first thing, he's got to get a coil. So, <sighs> so he came to me, and because uh, I made a couple of ribbons, sure, I'll help you. So what he did, we looked on YouTube and place, a couple of places, and he got a, um, do you remember these old Kodak cameras that would take flashes? You need something that's got a huge voltage. I mean, you need a capacitor, and you need to be able to generate a huge voltage on that capacitor uh, it's got to be a DC thing, and then you've got to discharge that voltage and uh, that capacitor through this coil. And the idea is that the current through the coil will die exponentially. So it's pulling it in, now as the current's high, it's accelerating, then when the thing gets near the center, the current starts dying, and there's a timing problem on this one too, and therefore there's no force that's going to resist it and fires it. So he built it. And the first test was upstairs on the third floor. We're in a room about this size. We got mounted on something. I was curious how this thing's gonna work. I know, in theory, it's gonna work, but when students build things, they don't always work first try. So I'm gonna go ahead and fire it. Not a sound, that was a duck. Except, an instant later, I think it was an absolutely silent weapon. I've never had anything that didn't make a single sound here at subsonic through this nail into the wall. Then I'm thinking, I'm glad I wasn't staying <laughs> uh, And I mean, it's a perfect assassin one. They probably have something like that as an assassin because there is no sound. And when I say no sound, I mean nothing. Not even a beep or anything, just, and there you hear, ding! Did you fire? I mean, yeah, of course. The only sound was it actually hitting the whatever. Yeah. Wow. Now, so me, me, I'm thinking, I know I went through the military. It's going to do with someone. <laughs> this is an assassin in the half cup. If you can't hear anything, and a guy gets shot, <laughs> falls backwards. I mean, <laughs> even silencers make noise. Talk about a nightmare for the police. So that, I'm just telling you that that solenoid can be used to accelerate things. Solenoids are usually what? They energize and put a current through them, and they'll pull pieces of metal through the center to turn on and off switches, if you know what a solenoid is. Okay, so in the book you have, I'm over time already. I think you, at least I got one perfect story so you can see how it applies in real life. Let me just take one look. Uh, we scheduled our test, right? Yes. 
And it's the 12th, that's right, Monday the 12th, yes. right? Okay. Yes. So this coming up Monday, we don't have class. Shocking. Uh, but Wednesday we do. Yes. And uh, can we have a quiz Wednesday? All right? Because we're if I give you one right now, obviously it's a little late, but I, I think uh, we, we'll do one Wednesday, all right? Okay with that? And I want to just tell you one thing for future reading. Uh, we're going to go through Ampere's Law. So if you want to do something, read this section on Ampere's Law. Law next time. And then uh, we'll take it from there. All right. Anyway, good talking to everybody. We'll see you Wednesday. I try to tell you stories that are, from my experience, that are pertinent. Because right. you know what? This stuff can be very dry.